This week marked Yom HaShoah, the day that we recall what happened in the Holocaust in the Jewish community. It's an interesting week as I've come to learn. As I scrolled through Instagram and TikTok, because I have become a little bit of a social media devouring person. It used to be news only that I devoured. But as I was scrolling through all of the Instagram feeds and pictures, little reels and videos on TikTok and the like, what became abundantly apparent was the question that has been in my mind ever since, which is how do we remember the Holocaust? In 2019, there was an Instagram account called Eva Stories, which went online. And there it attracted pretty quickly millions of followers who wanted to watch a digital adaptation of Eva Heyman's diary a diary written by a 13-year-old Jewish-Hungarian child who died in Auschwitz. The, product, the project was debated, it was criticized, and yet stuff like it continued. Equally interesting, fascinating, and disturbing are videos denying the Holocaust even existed. The fact that there's a group of rabbis on TikTok called Rabbis of TikTok who periodically get trolled by individuals who like to say not kind things on their TikTok channels, including and around Yom HaShoah also makes us, or we should be aware of, and make us begin to question why and what is going on. When Dwight D. Eisenhower entered the camps after they were liberated, he said, quote, the same day, April 12th, 1945, I saw my first horror camp. It was near the town of Gotha. I have never felt able to describe my emotional reactions when I first came face to face with indisputable evidence of Nazi brutality and ruthless disregard of every shred of decency. Up to that time, I had known about it only generally or through secondary sources. I am certain, however, that I have never at any other time experienced an equal sense of shock. I visited every nook and cranny of the camp because I felt it was my duty to be in a position from then on to testify at first hand about these things in case there ever grew up a, at home, in case there ever grew up at home, the belief or assumption that the stories of Nazi brutality were just propaganda. Some members of the visiting party were unable to thoroughly go through this ordeal I not only did so, but as soon as I returned to Patton's headquarters that evening, I sent communications to Washington and London, urging the two governments to send instantly to Germany a random group of newspaper editors and a representative group from national legislatures. I felt that the evidence should be immediately placed before the Americans and the British public in a fashion that would leave no room for cynical doubt. That was President Eisenhower's immediate response that we must record, otherwise we might forget. More than that, we might deny because the atrocities were so horrible, a new word of genocide sprang up as a result. But today we have a other challenge. It used to be that Yom HaShoah would come around, we would find a survivor, the survivor would come out, and they would share with us their specific narrative history, what they themselves went through. There was, in fact, when the Holocaust ended, supposedly 
a rough estimate of three and a half million such individuals around the world, some of whom found themselves in DP camps or displaced person camps, others in Israel, and others who ended up in various countries around the world, some even deciding to go back home into Europe. Today, the average age of those survivors is 85, of which there's an estimated 200,000 left. The ability to find them who are freely able to come and participate in such ceremonies is becoming much more of a challenge, which brings us back to an issue that I first found myself doing when scrolling through TikTok and Instagram. How are we going to remember? How will we create this narrative going forward? When we look at memory, we have to understand that we are the ones who construct the memory. It is up to us to choose how we want to look back at a specific event and say, this is how I'm going to remember it. This is how I think I will place it within the context of a narrative. And I want to be very straightforward that our language around such things is really, really important. When we think about what it was, the Holocaust, we even must be challenged by how we go ahead and define it, what it means, and how it will impact our life. The terms that we use are equally important. We have to realize that the Holocaust was not just a one thing event. It wasn't the diary of Anne Frank. It wasn't a visit at Auschwitz. It was much more than that. It was a series of events which led into what we now know today as the Holocaust in English. The term Holocaust refers, in fact, to the state-sponsored genocide of European juries perpetrated by Nazi Germany and its collaborators. And since the 1950s, that definition was the most well-known and most famous definition. But realize that the Nazi bureaucrats who coordinated the logistics of murdering used bureaucratic euphemisms such as evacuation, resettlement, and the final solution to the Jewish question to describe their efforts, which is unbelievable because it is absolutely human to do the same thing. When we look and think about how we treated Japanese at internment camps, we recalled them and thought of them as just that, internment camps. And yet, if we think about it in the Jewish community, we have other words for what happened. We tend to call it korban, destruction, or korban Europe, the destruction of Europe. Korban in Hebrew meaning literally destruction. And yet the term originally comes from the Second Temple period in Jerusalem in, in, in 70 CE to describe the paradigmatic catastrophe which led to the destruction of our people. Something that's commemorated annually on the holiday of Tisha B'Av. Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority in Israel, goes one step further. There they define Holocaust in Hebrew, we say Shoah, the name used in English to refer to the systematic destruction of European Jewry. Holocaust, just to be clear, comes from a Greek word, which is translated by the Hebrew word of Ola, because during biblical times, an Ola was the type of sacrifice brought before God, which was totally consumed and burnt by fire. Over time, the word became reference in Jewish understanding in circles with large-scale slaughter and destruction. What I mean by this is that is it a ritual sacrifice on a large scale? Is it something that invokes some sort of redemptive imagery for some? Or is it something that's cataclysmic, catastrophic, one-time event? All of these things come into play when we choose the narrative, the pictures, the vehicles that we're going to use when going forward when we no longer have individual survivors to share their stories, what we are left with, on the other hand, is our own devices and our own choosing of how we're going to commemorate and memorialize what transpired. What types of movies are we going to create? Are we going to create one similar to Life is Beautiful that almost has some sort of a love story attached to it? Are we going to use, are we going to Hollywoodify the scenario and kind of make all Nazis out to be pure evil without understanding that they were simply participating in the larger scale dehumanization of Jews in Europe.
How will we choose to look at Jews? Will we see them only as victims? Or will we see them also as individuals who, in some cases, rose up and fought against the Nazis? In any regard, all of these questions should be brought forward as we proceed in how we will choose to craft our own narrative. When we look at film and genres that have come out, even from the 1950s, through very recent film, which was screened um, earlier this week, which comes out on, on HBO of a boxer who fought other victims in the concentration camp, both to save himself and for the amusement of the Nazi guards, we see that the portrait of what it means to have participated in the Holocaust has evolved over time. We see that on one hand, earlier evidence or artistic displays demonstrated Jews as passive victims and Nazis as pure evil. Later, we see that they're masochistic and we see Jews as engaging in a resistance, which I think probably reflects some actuality. When we factor in Schindler's List and other movies, all of which portray a much more nuanced understanding of victim, perpetrator, antagonist, protagonist, hero, and the like. We're simply left with wondering, how will we go forward? And how can we contribute in our own way to ensure the most important lesson of all, that we never forget, that we have some sort of a narrative with evidence for, toward the deniers, and that we're able to memorialize the Holocaust in a constructed, uplifting, in some sense, hopeful that we can go forward, broader master narrative. May we find the energy and fortitude to do this important work. Shabbat Shalom.